Yeah, yeah. All right, everyone, welcome to yeah, yeah. episode nine of Chameleon Cuts. I'm so excited for our next chameleon. He is an astounding quintessential chameleon rocking a multitude of shades, Grammy award winning engineer for his work on Quincy Jones album, Juke Joint. And he's had number one albums in a multitude of genres from pop country to rock, R&B and non-classical. And he's also a musician, an educator, a composer, husband and father, and just an awesome person. <laughs> Please welcome Francis Buckley. Hey, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks for having me, man. <laughs> Oh my gosh, thank you so much for coming on my show. So today the topics we'll be talking about is Francis' journey, engineering, teaching, composing, home studio setup, and more. So uh, Francis, um, I'm so happy to have you on my show today. Thank you so much for being here and, and giving me some of your precious time. There's so many things that I, I want to ask you. And first off, welcome, welcome, welcome. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. We're um, coming down to the end of a quarter. Um, so next week is, is finals. So it's, you know, you've been there, you know, yep. you know where that you know, goes. <laughs> so it's kind of like a little, little bit madness and then it'll be two weeks of calm. Um, hopefully, um, we'll, we're starting to get back into normalcy at school where we're actually starting to, rather than doing all this online stuff. But this has been quite an experience mm. so <laughs> have there been any perks for you of doing doing all this course of study from home as opposed to being there in person well the biggest thing is the negative side as an as a student and as an instructor i miss the camaraderie of course i miss you know the 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 you know you get in the classroom a couple minutes early and everybody's like and the teacher comes in and he joins in the conversation and whatever and then class gets started now it's kind of like you know, I'm either teaching to a bunch of screens that have somebody's name on it, or I am a student where you can see me, but nobody else. <laughs> <laughs> right, but right. It's been, it's been an amazing experience for me because, uh, or I should say, we were talking about the pluses and minuses, right? The camaraderie, that, to me, that's the biggest minus. For me, the plus is, well, you live in Los Angeles, you know, we don't, we don't gauge things in, oh, I'm 20 miles from school. No, I'm an hour and a half from school. Right, right, an hour and a half. Yeah, I learned that yeah. the hard way, by yeah. the way. <laughs> so, it's an hour and a half to go there, it's an hour and a half to come back. So where I used to get off of school would end at five, I'd be home at 6.30. Now school is done at five, I'm home at five and one nanosecond. Yeah. Right. So I literally get three hours of my day back. Right. So that to me is that's the trade off. But this is here. This is here to stay. This is not going away. This all this all because look at for something like you and me in the old days, which was last year. <laughs> <laughs> in the old days, I would come to your studio and we would do this kind of thing. And it would be a little the inconvenience of coming down to your studio. Now it's not a problem. Hey, click, turn on my computer here. I'm home. Welcome to my studio. You know, <laughs> so this has been, you know, I'm have always been one of those people who's like, wow, this is this is really bad. But, you know, there's something good in here it's in no matter how ugly it is. If you dig deep enough, you'll find something. And that this is it. Saving right. This Silver lining for sure. Yeah, yeah. And I love that you brought up camaraderie because I've had the pleasure of interviewing all of your colleagues at MI and the the pattern of, you know, all of you talking each other up and just explaining how, um, cause I always, you know, I'm, I ask you guys the, the differences between like going from um, producing and how you, how your journey segued to teaching and becoming an educator. And all of them just talk about how they love it for so many different reasons. It's rewarding, it's grounding. And then also just getting to have the support of people like you and just getting to have that camaraderie. So yeah, yeah, in, in, in students and teachers. And it's, it's really been a very, very interesting experience to be on both sides of the desk at the same time. Mm. It's been very interesting. <laughs> For sure. So, I, you know, I can read things that's going on in class that none of the students can because they just have no idea. Just because I stand, I know exactly what you're going through, man. I know exactly what you're going through. Right, yeah. right. So. Sitting on both sides of class. And you were an incredible teacher. I loved having class with you. I learned a lot from you. And um, I loved how 
you always made things very, very simple to, to understand. Cause I mean, we are, we're dealing with complex concepts sometimes. Right. But um, you just had a way of making it humane and relatable and approachable. And for me, somebody as a vocalist coming to the program where I didn't, I had never really uh, delved into audio engineering at all. Yeah. So it, it, it felt comfortable to have somebody, you know, explaining signal flow to me in a language that I could understand. And, um, you know, not obsessing over the gear, not obsessing over bells and whistles, but talking about the important things yeah. that uh, it takes to build a great song. It's that it's the the new paradigm where, um, uh, you know, you the it was the way it was done. Where I mean, you could go to a school like MI, right? Go through for yourself. Go through the vocal program. You know, be the best vocalists that ever graduated from there go out get a gig start working spend your whole life in the music business in studios out of studios all this and never touch a button not so today not so today what 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 did you and i just do i sent you a track you sang on it and sent it back to me did i engineer it no you did <laughs> <laughs> and i'm you know i didn't have to call you up and go oh maria this vocal sounds horrible right because I, <laughs> I mean, you need to understand this stuff. And it's to, to my chagrin or whatever the word would be, as an audio engineer, I'm teaching you to do my job, which means you're doing my job now. <laughs> oh, that's so cool, Francis. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Oh, I love that. <laughs> that's so great. Thank but, you for sharing it's, that. <laughs> it's putting me out of work. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's the, real, that's the new reality, is that you really do need to understand this, because if I called you up, if, if I had my Rolodex, and I had my list of singers, and it's like, okay, I'm always going to start with my, my number one, I'm going to call you up, and you, you go, no, I can't do it, okay, I'm going to go to number two, and if the reason number one can't do it is because they don't have the facility, mm -hmm. the number one slips out of the number one position for a while until number one gets their act together, because... Wow. This is the way it is, you know? I I'm mean, taking lots of notes, you, Francis. <laughs> you can collaborate with people around the world now in a way that you could yeah. never do before. Never. Yeah. And, and speaking of yeah. which, I have, I always indicate on my map where we are. So we are clearly in California today. So I have it indicated on my map here. And it's, it's super fun. And again, just to quickly talk about the thesis of Chameleon Cuts, it's like I wanted to provide a platform for um, people who, you know, wanted to learn more about this business, but didn't really have the, they didn't know the specific resources that they, that were available to them or what was reputable. And, you know, so I've been trying really hard to bring on these amazing amazing guests such as yourself and just provide a platform for people to, to learn for free and uh, for you guys to talk about what's going on in your world as well, because it's all great stuff and we, yeah. we all want to know about it and follow you and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So Francis, let, let's take it back to the beginning really quickly. So you're from Detroit, Michigan, right? Yes, right. Yep. And, and you went to uh, college for music as well. Yeah. I, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm a very lucky person in just finding myself in the right place at the right time. When I went to high school in Detroit, um, we had I had two of the most amazing music teachers in the world. I had a gentleman band director named Carl Stone and a choir director named Gordon Nelson. Now, Carl Stone, Detroit was, up until the time I left, Detroit was a black and white city. Mm -hmm. Okay, there wasn't, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't have friends that were like, you know, I didn't have Jewish friends and Mexican friends. When it was, you were Polish or Irish or German or, you know, the neighborhood I grew up in. Wow. And no, almost no contact with anybody, any, anybody black, right? So, and it wasn't like there was overt racism or any of this kind of stuff. It just, we didn't think about it. Mm -hmm. I didn't. Right. So when I went to high school, I was in a, I went to Catholic school, grade school. So I went with all my friends in the neighborhood. We all walked to school together in big gangs, right? And come high school, I went to public high school. And my mother, my mother, who was always strove independence, I, the, the high school was a ways from where we lived, the public high school. It's like, oh my God, all by myself, I got to go to public high school. Mm -hmm. um, I said, how am I going to get there? And she said, I don't know. <laughs> she was oh. me independence. I had to figure out how to get to school. Okay. So anyway, um, I got there and I joined the band and the, the band director, Carl Stone, was black, right? So this was really my first 
interaction with anybody of color outside of what was said in the community I lived in. But wow. it wasn't it was Italian. It was like everybody loved everybody. There was no nothing, no no hatred that I Maybe. really. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then when I went to college right after high school, um, I had the worst music teachers in the world. They were so. I mean, eight o'clock in the morning, ear training with this guy who was like, "Who's that actor? Bueller, Bueller." <laughs> I know who you're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> monotone. Ear training. The worst. Oh, you know, and I hated it. But I had amazing science teachers. I had a biology and a body teacher. So here I'm as a music major. I'm getting C's in music. I'm getting A's in biology, botany, speech. Wow. So I did what all good music school students do. I dropped out of school and I joined a band and moved to California. <laughs> all right, rock and roll. <laughs> yeah, you know. um, one of the things when I kind of look back at my journey is this idea of stepping off a cliff because that's what, that's what you have to do. You can, you can sit on the edge of the cliff the rest of your life and go nowhere, right? right. Um, yeah. I had... When I graduated high school, um, before I went off to college, I, I took a year to, to, to learn what was going on in the real world, which uh, looks very sound philosophical, but it was like, I'm sick of school. I'm not going to school. Mm, right. Sure. So I got a job building cars. You know, Detroit worked in the factories, right? <gasps> and I had um, a very big life revelation when I was working in the factory. Well, actually, two of them. One of them was I used to take a part out of a bin and a car would roll by, and I would screw the part on the car, and the car would go by. And I would take another piece out, and I would screw it in. And it was so mechanical, so thought out, that I could pull out a certain number of wires, and I got to the last wire, it was lunchtime. And the whistle would go off. And I'd come back from lunch, and I'd lay out a bunch of wires. I'd get to the last wire, it would be time to go home. That's how mechanized it was. Right? Wow. So revelation number one is, the only reason I'm doing this is because they haven't built a machine to do this. And as soon as they build that machine, I'm out of a job. Okay. Number two was, I am really not into cars, so what the hell am I doing to car business? <laughs> really? You know, that's the whole thing, and that's, that's always been my thing. It's like, you should do this, you should do that. I'm not into that. I'm not into that. I... I you know, I, as I as I told my then girlfriend, now wife, when I when I when I finished engineering school, um, and quit my nice little secure job in a warehouse, um, <laughs> that if I don't take this chance, if I don't do this, you're going to wind up with an angry old man. Wow. You're wind up with. You know. <laughs> so really, That's amazing. And all of that came from a. When I learned to play drums, the guy who taught me to play drums, my grandfather's cousin, who was like in his 80s, he was the original drummer for the NBC Orchestra on radio. Wow. Right. He played drums, his wife played piano. Anyways, he said to me about working in the music business, he said, everybody's going to tell you it's a, it's a great hobby, but don't go do it. But he told me, he said, and now I can say this to you because it's my life story as well, I spent my entire life in the music business. I never lived high in the hog, but man, I loved every minute of it. Say that about you. Oh, see, goosebumps. <laughs> I love it. Brilliant. And so, you know, you, your wife supporting you, like, that's so amazing. And, you know, you went, you, you took your journey to Los Angeles, right? And you were in a band at the time. Mm -hmm. And then um, after you guys broke up and, you know, you started engineering, working in sessions and, that you talking about being pushed off the edge of the cliff, right? You just got thrown into that session with a black flag where like the chief engineer just quit and you had to just like, it was like showtime and sink or swim. And that was another, you know, as I say, I'm, I'm lucky and I'm, I'm willing to step off these cliffs. Fortunately, I was young at the time and it's a much easier to step off the cliff when you're young. But For sure. <laughs> I, um, yeah, I got that job at, at Unicorn Records in Hollywood and was only, I mean, this, I'm less than a year out of school. And the, yeah, I was there a couple of weeks when she called me and said, Chief Engineer quit. You're now Chief Engineer. And the group Black Flag will be here at one o'clock to do their new record, which, by the way, hangs on the wall right there. Wow. Pretty amazing. Um, and at the time, the interesting thing, and this is, was another lesson that I was taught, was that um, 
at that at that time that would have been 1979 1980 something like that and i was not into punk whatsoever i was into progressive rock baby i was into stuff that was hard to play and time change and all this stuff and it's like here comes this punk band three chords and a guy you know hollering into a microphone but that's when i realized it's like yeah i may not be into this but i'm hired to do it my name's going on that record you know so it's like okay so i i developed this idea that you know i don't i don't have two toolboxes i don't have a demo toolbox and a master toolbox i have one toolbox and i bring it to right. every session I love that. And because then you had also mentioned in one of your previous interviews about um, MCA music publishing and how uh, Leaves Levy talked about like, we don't do demos here, we do masters only. And I thought that that was really cool because yeah. I, I wanted to ask you, would you say that like having that high expectation, like, you know, kind of just turn your your production methods into another gear and maybe helped you grow even more like, like you're suggesting right now? Well, <laughs> let, me, let me give you a condensed timeline because it was very condensed. Right. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> and out of school, less than a year out of school, and I get made chief engineer at this little recording studio. And you know, I only did. I I, I assisted a gentleman named John Guess, and I assisted a gentleman named Ed Stasium, just very shortly. So I never was an assistant engineer, and I stayed at that studio for maybe six or eight months. When the school I went to, which was Soundmasters, um, they called me and, and said, hey, we got another job that looks like it'd be better for you. Would you be willing to go and interview? And I said, yeah, what is it? And they said, well, it's Universal Studios MCA Publishing. And so I just went over there. So, you know, I graduated in, wow. in, in January of 1980. I'm sorry, January of 1981. Uh, October 12th, 1981, I got hired at Universal as chief engineer. So it was like, boom. Yeah. It like happened, right? Women so go. When you, when you talk about, you know, did that take take my production level to my production to another level? I had no level. <laughs> <laughs> I had none. I was just okay. Wow. I'll mix this. Okay, I'll work with Glenn Ballard. Okay, I'll work with Kerry Chater. Okay, I'll work with Mark Muller. Okay, I'll work with Kashif. Okay, I'll work with all these great writers. Oh gosh, you know, I, I love when you also brought up talking about um, you didn't want to eat the session because when you're going into a place with gear that's not yours and how, and all of that, like, mm -hmm. I think that's that was really, really impactful to hear and very good lesson. Yeah. Well, to me, and, and, and another part of my upbringing as well is, again, the fact that I never really um, tutored under anybody. My, my mentor, Brian Inglesby, um, when I went to school, his thing was signal flow and signal processing. You know where the signal is going, and you know how to, how to work with it. That's really all you need to know. Everything else is going to be changing technology the whole time. Right. And um, so when I got out there, you know, again, all of a sudden I'm chief engineer. I just got to figure this stuff out. Right. So I never like all this outboard gear and all this stuff. I didn't know any of that stuff. I knew we, we own these compressors in the studio. For me, if all I knew, those were the only compressors in the entire world. <laughs> right. <laughs> were the only ones I knew. You're like, this stuff's great. <laughs> so I learned to do it by, you know, my big thing was, was using my ears. Right. But Really, honestly, and truly, when I look back, the real the real training came in when what I would do is I would go out and get records and bring records into the studio, right? So I'm going to mix a rock track today. So on the way to the studio, I'm going to stop at the record store and I'm going to get I'm going to go to the top ten, by the way, and mm. I'm gonna do rock records from the top ten. I'm going to buy them and I bring them into the studio. And I would listen to the records and listen to my mix and listen to the records and listen to my mix. And let me tell you <laughs> how brutal that is when you first start doing <laughs> Oh, gosh. Wow. Great. Ah, my God. <laughs> so that's literally how I did it. And I would learn to focus in on, like, what, what, what's with the drums? Why do their drums sound bigger and like the guy's hitting it harder or something and it was like I just most of it is just logic well there's something about he's hitting it harder well what is that that's volume well what do you use to affect volume well, dynamics processors limiters and compressors okay let me put a limiter across it and mess with it until I got it to sound like that 
right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, knew, I knew the science. Brian taught me, you know, how all the processors work, right? And that was his, his big thing, and that's what I always carried on and passed to my students, right? It's don't learn how to work something. Learn how something works. Mm. Don't learn how to work a comp compressor. Learn how a compressor works. Then you can use any compressor in the world. Very cool. And then like you would specifically listen to those mixes and your mixes in the same studio, right? So you could like gauge the space and like. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. No, that would be so much sense. Yeah. While I'm, while I'm mixing, because, you know, it's like I have no, as I said, we said to raise you up a level. I had no level. I was like <laughs> very much at the beginning learning to, to how did they do this? How did they? And it was like, well, just listen to them. Right. Unbelievable. And the other thing that came out of it, and again, I would love to be Pee Wee Herman and say I meant to do that, right? <laughs> um, is that I never really realized that what I was listening to was finished, commercially released, mastered mixes. So I was making my mixes sound like finished mixes. So when I started going to, and getting gigs and, you know, working in these studios and our projects would get mastered, um, I did, we, I got introduced to Bernie Grunman and, and Bernie Grunman Mastering and that's where I've been going all this time. And I, I never really realized it until years later that I would go into mastering and he would put my stuff up and do a little something to it and cut the record and I would take the record home and listen to it and go great or do a little something and, and I didn't think anything of it. And then I was asking him one day about mixing other people's records, and he goes, "Yeah, man, there are people come in here, and I'm, I'm, I'm working on them for hours." And it's like, really? I'm, well, why would that be? Are they? I'm, I'm, you know, I never thought, "Wow, am I that good?" No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? But you but, were. But why? What is it? Why would it be? And I went, "Well, buzz, boing, I'm comparing my stuff not to somebody else's mixes, but to somebody else's masters." All right. Wow. That taught me valuable lessons, you know, about how to how to mix right the that's idea. amazing yeah it's got to fit in with everybody else to a certain degree mm, to a certain degree yeah. Yeah. i love that that's so great so yeah. francis i have to talk to you about jagged little pill i have to okay. talk to you about it i mean first of all that album made a huge impact on me right and there's so many special things about that album so just to quickly tell you the story of how I even listened to it. So, um, you know, when I was little, if, if, if you had CDs, you were lucky, you know, my family didn't have much money. So like the first CD I had ever bought was like the Cranberries, Faithful Departed, and I didn't have anything else yet. Yes. So I was at my cousin's house in North Carolina and my cousin, Nikki, um, he pulled out this album and it had all this, this colorful decor all over it. And I was like, whoa, this is really cool. And he and he played it for me and I was eight years old and something struck me so, so, mm -hmm. so rang so true to me about that album. And it stayed with me throughout my life. I mean, in so many different ways. And it's so funny because I feel like I'm coming full circle now where I get to talk to you about it. And just like, you know, I, I know that that was a spontaneous gig for you. And I, I love how you said that you thought the music industry really got it right with with Alanis and with her the success of her um Grammy winning album of the year um can you talk about that journey and what it was like to be around an artist that was so raw and and organic and you know untouched by the industry in a way where like she was still doing what felt true to her and um can you yeah. talk a little bit about that yeah well <clears throat> Jagged Little Pill actually has two lives right I cut with Glenn Ballard I cut 10 songs of which two of them survived to wind up on the album. Um, um, you ought to know, and it's either, I get it mixed up either, hand, I mean, um, you ought to know or ironic. I forget which of Both the of two. them, I think. It was you and ironic, and, yeah. Um, you ought to know. Perfect. Now, perfect is the only song that is absolutely complete. I did start to finish mix the whole thing. Gorgeous song. They <sighs> brought in a couple of other big name guys to remix it and, and went with my mix, but that's a, that, that's a different story. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, Glenn Ballard and I had, had worked together for quite a long time. In fact, he was the guy when I got the job at MCA for an audition, they had me go and cut a song with Glenn. And I still have the cassette from that song that we wow. cut. Anyone. Anyways, um, he and I worked together on all kinds of stuff. And most of it was new artists, right? The only artist that we worked with who wasn't brand new Kind of like when we first got started, we, we did like Evelyn King and Thelma Houston and Teddy Pendergrass and all these great R&B artists, um, Pointer awesome. Sisters. I think we did like four records with the Pointer Sisters or something. And 
the Wilson Phillips album was the one we did before that, and that is a exercise in perfection, right? There is not one, there's not one wrinkle in that album anywhere. We spent a lot of time making that record, getting those harmonies just right. And, and so to a certain degree, Jagged Little Pill was kind of like... Yeah, the opposite end of the spectrum. Yeah, and it originally started out, um, I guess you know the story, she was a pop star in Canada and whatnot, right. and came down to LA and walked, went around town writing with everybody, and, and, and I guess none of it really worked out. And in the end, she was signed to MCA Canada, and of course, Glenn is MCA in LA. So they um, put the two of them together, and it was like, boom. Magic. It happened, right? But at that time, we had been doing a lot of brand new artists. Right, Wilson Phillips was a new artist. We just sold 15 million copies, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the idea that she came along as this new artist, it was kind of like any other new artist. It's like, yeah, the potential's there, right? Um, Wilson Phillips, it was like, what's the potential? Pedigree. <laughs> <laughs> And Wilson and 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 and, uh, and John Phillips's daughters for crying out loud! All you got to do is write some great songs because they can sing. Right? But when she came along, it was one of those things that it was like he and I both knew this is the real deal. Not that it was like this is no idea that it was going to be anything. It was just this was a project to believe in. Oh. This is something to go. Wow, you could, you know, and most of the songs, the 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 setup that I did with them, because a gentleman named Chris Fogel, who had been my assistant, one of the greatest assistant engineers of all time, now a big time film uh, scoring mixer, mm. um, what's it, um, uh, Black Panther, and I mean, his his all right, incredible. Anyways, um, uh, so. What I would do is I would come down in the morning and get the studio set up for them so they could write, right? And we would get everything set up and she would show up and we would go and have lunch and they would talk about what they were going to do that day. So when we came back from lunch, I'd make sure that everything was set up for them and then I would leave and they mm. would, and Glenn would call me sometimes in the evening, come down and mix something, right? Perfect. I think that was really late night. I think he called me around midnight and asked me, can I come down and put a quick mix on this? So I did, and I went down and I put a quick mix, no more than a couple hours, which was the kind of the whole album. The, the first part of it was songwriting demos that were just poop, right? Not not the way I thought Glenn would make a record because he was very much a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. and, um, you can and, hear that rawness and that organicness on yeah. the record, though. And I, I mean, it, it rings so true to me, like as, as a singer and just as a woman, like hearing the things she was saying, she was talking about, like there's something to be said about not polishing every type of it. It, it has to be conducive to the project, I feel like is what. Yeah. Is yeah. And, and part of it was also the fact that it was kind of like, um, you know, we need to put something out. I'm just going to put this out. They, you know, from what from what I understand, my side of the, you know, from what I saw it from, um, it was it was a. They just put the album out to see what would happen. There was no promotion. They sent it to college radio stations, and it just caught fire. It just caught fire. Wow! Mm -hmm. They had no idea it was going to be the. No, and that's why show. you know you mentioned about where I said they the business got it right. This was this really to me showed the right and the wrong, right? In that everybody turned it down because it was like you know whiny, overly sensitive, whiny chick singers. Nobody's buying that. It's, it's grunge right now, you know. And, um, you know, just one of those. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, Madonna signing her because, from what I understand, because they were contractually obligated to put out a record, right? And, you know, I mean, it was like, yeah, they, you know, they, they I'm not saying that it was just like, yeah, whatever, just throw it out. No, they put their time into it, but not the way, that I was used to working with Glenn. It was a little quicker, a little, you know. But then I left the project when it was still in the demo shopping stage. Mm -hmm. And I went to work with Quincy. Yes. Was supposed to be four days. <laughs> and turned into seven and a half of the most glorious months of my career. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. And in that time, and this is the other amazing thing about Atlantis, right? From the time I left, at the time I finished Quincy's record, they finished it, and that album did its mercury, what's the word, mercurical rise to number one before I finished Quincy's record. And that's <laughs> In 95. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy. Oh, my gosh, that's amazing. So, and then you, I mean, that album, uh, Juke Joint, 
just the caliber of artists that are on that album is crazy. Like I, mean, I, I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea, and it was that's why it was such a great experience. And 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 Patty Austin in a in an interview one time, you know, she's kind of Quincy's goddaughter. Um, she said in an in interview one time, "You come into a session with Quincy. There's two hours of goofing around and silliness, and everybody having a good time. And then we go out and we record for ten minutes. But what happens in that ten minutes is a reflection of that two hours of the craziness, fun, party atmosphere that happened in the studio. And it was like, yeah." It, you know, and these guys, we're working with Quincy, man, but we're having a great time, and now it's time to go record. Absolutely, man, let's make it happen. Wow, you know? that's yeah. so special. So, what, what are what else are your favorite things about Quincy's energy and the way that he treats the musicians that he works with? Well, first of all, he treats everybody equally. Everybody equally. I never saw him treat a runner like a runner, right? Um, uh, you know, as a as an engineer, I mean, I got hired in to do the project and there was no, it was, because you know, who am I filling in for, man? I'm filling in for Bruce Swedeen for crying out loud. <laughs> I'm nervous, <laughs> right? And, um, but it was never, he never questioned anything I did. It was never, is that the right microphone? Are you sure you're doing this right? Any of that stuff. It was all, you know, great, sound great, let's, you know, do it. And I, um, I introduced him and the world, I might remind the world, <laughs> that ADATs and these little digital recorders were not toys, they were tools, right? So that's where I got my, one of my, you know, I learned how to come up with these sayings having worked with Quincy. My saying is, you know, people say, oh, it's a toy. I say, it's only a toy in the hands of a child. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> That's glorious. I, I think it speaks to so many volumes, just the simple concept of lifting somebody else up to to a level and like um, giving them that like it, it can do so much for for anyone. He didn't walk by anybody. He would come in and, 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 and jolly around with the receptionist and talk <laughs> to the runners as they were, you know, and it's like he talked to everybody. He was just, you know, and then that was everybody wanted to work with him. Everybody wanted to work for him. Um, it was just, it was an amazing opportunity. And for me, I, I, you know, I mean, I had, Glenn Ballard was signed to Quincy's company as a producer. So that was how I knew Quincy. I'd never worked with him before, right? And I got a call from his production coordinator um, about, you know, uh, Bruce's off doing history? History, yeah. No, yeah, he's doing history with Michael Jackson. Right, and Quincy's going into the studio and, and needs a, a, a an engineer, and was un wondering if you'd be interested in the project. <laughs> and it was like, no, <laughs> I got something to do. I got to mow my lawn. <laughs> Watch the Laker game, you know. <laughs> right, right. Um, Unbelievable. But it was it was one of those things that it, it'll never be repeated, right? Because no one no one has got that kind of clout to do that kind of thing where you know like back in the block which was a huge record in the dude which is a huge record Quincy didn't play a note he didn't write a note right he was the arranger but he's got Jerry Hay and he's got Greg Filling Gaines and he's got Rod Temperton and he's got all the you know he 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 told me one time he's a casting director and it's true it's true that's you pick this guy because because he has a core band, but the times I've worked with him, it's been different members of that core band. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of see the reason why. Why did he bring in Vinny this time instead of John Robinson? Oh, uh, I see. You know? Yeah. Now, there's a level. There's, there's a level. <laughs> yeah. That is so cool. And it's all levels of greatness. Just yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. When you, you know, the, that old saying, the tide raises all ships. Right. So when Quincy walks in the room, you know who you're working with. So you bring your best game. Well, you bring your best game and somebody else brings theirs. And, you know, next thing you know, yeah, it's it's happening. Next you know? thing you know, you've got a Grammy Award winning album for best non-classical album. Unbelievable. Like huge you know, congratulations for that. And it was thank you very much. It was a that was a very offsetting experience as well, I, I must say, because you start off with, you know, that comes around and there's. 9,700 categories <laughs> and there's 150 people in each category and you find your name in there and you go, oh, wow, that's cool. We, somebody, somebody submitted it for, you know, great. 
And then the next ballot comes along and it's down to, you know, 100 categories with 10 people and it's like, oh, my name is still there. And then it's down to, you know, 50 categories with three names and it's like, oh my God, I got, I got nominated for a Grammy. <laughs> I was like, wow. And not only, I mean, for me, the Grammy nomination was absolutely a thrill. No, the, yeah. Yeah, no arguing that. But the bigger thrill was the guys I was with. It was me, Bruce Sweden, Al Schmidt, and Tommy Vicari. And between Bruce and Al, I don't think they ever made that many Grammys. <laughs> I mean, Al's got 20. Yeah. So here I am sitting amongst giants, and it was like, I was the most humbling experience. <laughs> wow, that's so beautiful. And you know, from then you went on to be a part of multiple number one albums in multiple genres and country, you know, and pop and R&B. You worked with yeah. Cool J, you worked with so many different people. So I think that your journey has been amazing. And I, the next thing that I wanna ask you about is how you segued into teaching from, from this. Well, again, sort of a kind of circuitous <laughs> um, but I have, um, uh, you know, let's face it, been in the studio a long time. I have hearing problems, okay? I have tinnitus in one ear, and it was kind of like I kind of need to, to to back away from the speakers. I need, You know, it's unfortunate. It's a big part of my job, right? But I kind of, to sort of use the word, semi-retired. Mm. So um, I got a call one time from where I went to school, which was called Sound Masters, which had become Pinnacle College, asking me if I'd like to do a seminar. And it was like, wow, I, you know, I felt bad because I thought the school had gone out of business. And I, I accidentally blurted on the phone, wow, I thought you guys went out of business. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> wrong. <laughs> So they had me come down to do a seminar and, you know, I, it was cool. And at the end of the seminar, I just kind of said, you know, you guys ever interested in a teacher? I might, I might be interested in doing this. And oh my God, this is another one of those, you know, how did I get here? They had just started a weekend program and they didn't have anybody to run it. So two months later, I'm running a weekend program at a recording school, never having taught in my life. Wow. <laughs> and the opening day story is, is another one of those stories. Right? <laughs> The, and I'm because I'm, I'm talking to the guy who who runs the place, a gentleman named Dan Heck, great guy, um, and he's telling me, yeah, it, it's it's easy, man. The syllabuses are great. He's just teaching the syllabus. You know, we got them all in the in the lounge. When you come in, come in, you know, half hour early. We'll we'll walk you through stuff, right? So my first teaching adventure is it's a four hour lecture class, but it's two hours and an hour break, and then two hours, right? And so I go in and they're introducing me around and all of this stuff and, and it's taking a long time and it's eating up all this time for prep, right? So I go into the teacher's lounge and I get the syllabus and I go into the classroom and I put it on the podium and, you know, I know that I'm going to be playing for time here, right? So the first thing I do is I go, hey, tell me about yourself. Let's waste a half an hour going <laughs> 25 minutes going around the class, right? So we go through all that. It's pretty cool. And I'm starting to relax and feeling a little bit better. And I walk over to the podium and I open the, the book up to page one, right? And it's three sentences. That's the whole, I got to teach four hour lecture. <laughs> three sentences. <laughs> I mean, now I can do one word, compression. Okay. You know, three hours of compression. You right. Know? But it was, it, was, it was very daunting, but I fell in love with it almost immediately almost immediately, right? And here's how you can tell that it was love, okay? Because the guy said, we'd love to hire you to do it. And I said, great, what do you pay? He said, $17 an hour. And I said, you know, the last time I worked for $17 an hour, I was probably a teenager. Right. But a little voice in the back of my head, which sounded a lot like my wife, may I point out, <laughs> said, take the gig. <laughs> So I took the gig because it was kind of like, hey, it gave me something to do. And next thing you know, I'm the curriculum director and I'm writing curriculum and I'm basically running things. And it was, it was awesome. And then that school kind of, you know, I could tell that it was getting, and I got a beautiful offer to run the um, audio engineering program at Musicians Institute. So I came on as the program chair and I thought, this is going to be fun. Yay. I'm yeah. Gonna, 
schedule classes and I'm going to do and uh, it's going to be great. And, and I get in there and I find out it's scheduling and payroll and, 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 and QuickBooks. And it was like, are you kidding me? Get me out of here. Bunch so, of admin work. Yeah, yeah. I lasted a year and it was like, you know, and came back as a teacher and had been in there now, I think, six years. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And it's been great. I've, I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I, I, I would go back in the studio in a heartbeat. Uh, well, let me put it this way. I would feel worse about giving up teaching than I did about giving up audio engineering. Right? Why? Because I had, and, and I don't want to sound like I, I did it all. I, I've done everything. I don't, I don't know what the next experience is because I don't like the new way of doing it. Right. I like to get in the studio with a bunch of musicians who can play and push record and, and have the hairs on my arms stand up and be the least talented guy in the room. Right. Nowadays, I got to be the drummer. I got to put him in time. I got to be the vocalist. I got to put him in tune. And, you know, to me, it's like to have the vocalist say, you can fix that. Right. And I go, y you're the vocalist. All right. I don't. I don't relish sitting in front of a computer. I really don't. Unless I have something really cool, get a great band. It's like, wow, I'm going to mix this. It's going to be great, right? So, yeah, I'm I, I'm a purist. I don't. I love that. I don't have a folder full of plugins. You know, I need an EQ, a compressor, a noise gate, a reverb, and some tracks, and I'm good to go. You know, but that of course comes from old school where you know i'd walk into a recording studio and i'm going to mix what's what's the reverb situation we have a plate okay guess what i'm using <laughs> right or we have a chamber and a plate oh cool well i'll use a chamber on this and the plate on that decision made right nowadays and this is part of the problem nowadays i got ten thousand reverbs how long is it going to take you to choose a reverb forever <laughs> yeah it's I, I totally agree, you know, and it's kind of, I, I want to start producing more, but it's intimidating even getting started because I'm just like, oh, and, you know, it's just so much to learn. And so in, in turn, to be honest with you, like as a vocalist, I've just used my voice a lot to do things that maybe could have been done in production, like filling out harmonies that could have been done with like a bass line or just things like that. I kind of subconsciously do that in a way when I'm trying to round out mixes and make them feel whole, kind of like in the song that we did together, I just put that do up section in the end because just wanted to add some movement or, or whatever like yeah. that kind of idea so i totally get what you're saying yeah yeah um the only thing that i can say was not uh learned in a vacuum for myself was producing mm. now i don't i don't i label myself an engineer producer i'm not a producer engineer what you know uh in studying quincy his thing is your your core strength well my core strength what do i bring to the table i'm an audio engineer that's what I bring to the table, right? Um, and I teach a class called music production, right? And one of the students said to me, but you're, you're not really a producer. And I said, well, no, I mean, I've produced some stuff. I don't really bill myself as a producer. But let me tell you the advantage that you have with somebody like me teaching the class, okay? I've worked with Phil Ramone, Quincy Jones, uh, um, uh, um, Glenn Ballard, uh, um, um, Richard Perry. I mean, I've worked with all of these great producers and I've watched how all of these great producers work. And that's how I've learned to produce was by watching these guys and learning from these guys, Absolutely. right? So rather than I teaching you producing from my point of view, this is how I produce. I teach producing from, hey man, I've watched the best. Now when it comes to engineering, yeah, I teach it from my point of view because that's what I know. But at the same time, I know that I, I think it's something I get from my dad. My dad was a great cook, right? I never saw my father with a recipe, ever, <laughs> ever, ever, ever. <laughs> he was a cook at the firehouse, right? And, you know, if you're cooking at the firehouse, you better be good because those guys will throw you out of the kitchen. And, hurt <laughs> and they're hungry. <laughs> I never saw him with a recipe. He just cooked by feel or ingredient or, or experience or what right so to me it was like i i when i my experience at mca it was the 10 years that i spent running that studio there was no assistant engineer it was just me 
So I had to learn to do everything and make the session work as the... So when I started going out and doing records, the assistant engineers would go, oh, no, man, I'll do that. Oh, what? Oh, you know, well, I'm, I'm plugging stuff in. And, yeah. well, I'll do that. Yeah. I'll do that. It's like, oh, oh, that's right. I, I have somebody that do that for me now. <laughs> you know? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. So it's been, it's been a very unique thing. And to me, it's been... Number one, I, I was prepared. When I went to school right um just that idea of what what i see is a lot of people like to teach all of the you here's the modern thing you do all this stuff right but the old school thing was i get a guy that can play guitar and i put up a microphone and he plays his guitar and i shouldn't have to when he's done you know um my my current peeve <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, you go from working with musicians like the ones that have been a part of your career and it's like, yeah, you set you set a standard for yourself for now and it's just like you're, you know, you really appreciate the music that was just Yeah. And I mean, if somebody has got a thing, right? But they need the support of the studio, that's one thing. But if you ain't got a thing and you think the studio is going to provide you with the thing, it's not going to happen. It's got to come in the front door, right? Um, somebody was talking about, uh, um, you know, the the type of microphone that you put up in front of your artist, right? And you know, you you gotta you gotta talk about the voice and you know the power and what the song and all this thing. So it comes down to you know the microphone that you put in your art in front of your artist. And I said, no, man, it's the artist you put in front of your microphone. For Christ's sake. <laughs> So cool. Yeah. Since you brought up, since you brought up a vocalist again, can we talk about Celine Dion and when you worked with uh, with her, or if it was a was it a record that you engineered for her? See, that's one of those things that here's here's why all these things sort of get tossed around. Um, yeah. I worked on on stuff not with her, okay, but on stuff of hers, like the same with with Barbara Streisand, which I don't put in there because people go, "Oh, you work with Streisand." No, I worked on some of her stuff with her engineer, John Arias, and I could put that on my resume. Okay, very um, cool. That's somebody digging into to, um, IMDb and like finding, you know, um, if you go in IMDb, it looks like I've made six albums with Quincy. I haven't. I've done three projects. I did the, the big Q's Juke Joint. Well, what they're doing is they take something from Q's Juke Joint and put it on another record. So that people go, wow, you've done six albums with Quincy. <laughs> Right, right, right. And a whole bunch of songs with him that have wound up in, in other places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, when you, you mentioned earlier on about, you know, the fact that I teach simplicity, and the reason why I teach simplicity is because you got to think simply because, man, it can get really, really, really complex. Really complex. But if you keep boiling it down to, all I'm doing is I'm recording a vocalist, right? Or I'm recording something but there's not only a vocalist there's a guitarist there's a drummer a bass player and a, and, a, and a keyboard player but i'm doing the same thing to each one of them right it's not a whole different process so it's like right. i like to say it's like it's like juggling right you throw a ball up in the air and catch it easy singer in front of a microphone right now the singer wants to play acoustic guitar hey now it's two microphones <laughs> right now the singer wants the guitar player wants a bass player hey now you're juggling right Next thing you know, the bass player wants to drum, or man, you got 12 balls in the air, but you're still just simply throwing, you're plugging a microphone in. Yeah, I love it. And it's like, no matter what genre it is, it's just like, it's the same, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Yeah. It's just di different people and different feels and just yeah. capturing all that magic. But you do, you do have to understand the genres. And, and, and as you mentioned, you know, yeah, I've had, I've had number ones in a lot of genres. And that's because I don't think in terms of genres. I do in terms of, you know, I'm going to do a country record. Well, I'm then I should probably listen to, you know, what style this guy is and find out what he's in, right? Um, there's something cool about bringing, you know, rap sensibilities to country, country sensibilities to jazz, jazz sensibilities to rap. There's mm. definitely a, because it's all music. Mm. There's a really between it all so to me i really find it interesting when people go no i don't, I don't do that kind of music <laughs> wow man Whew. that's a whole that's a whole <laughs> other part of the kitchen you haven't gone into <laughs> you know yeah uh, 
Oh my gosh. So yeah. true. I think that, I think that's such a humongous point to make. And then I also, you know, you talk about making your own luck. Um, you were talking about that in your interview with Rhodes and I would love it if you could give some insights to our young viewers as to what that means to you today, you know, and if you think it's more of a challenge with, with COVID and people not wanting to open their studios to many people and how can they do that? Or do you think that there's, you know, what do you think about the future? Well, I think we're, we're kind of staring right in the face of the future with this. Literally. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and as this becomes more of daily use, right? Like I think about when I had my first cell phone, right? And what I do now, my first cell phone was, you know, I had a cord that was attached to a base. You know, it looked like, I looked like Maxwell Smart, open my briefcase and pull his phone out, you know, to what we have now. And to think of, you know, when I was, when I was in the heyday of analog recording going, God, you know, it'd be so cool if I could, do, and you go, but there's no way you could do it. And now it's like, I don't even have to think about it. I can do it, right? Um, so to me, the whole thing is is that you want to get somewhere, you got to be prepared, okay? You can't just go, I hope that I learn this stuff somewhere. No, you got to, and the more you can learn about the process, right? And the process includes the song, the arrangement, the, the, the musicians, right? The, the engineer, the producer, the mix, the artwork, the social media, the, the distribution, the, the, all of that stuff. And if you, what you don't understand is where your record will come to a halt, mm. right? And in this day and age, the same as I was saying about you, you could go through your whole career and never touch the record button. Not anymore, right? You could have gone through your whole career and never ever had the word promotion and marketing ever come out of your mouth, but now you got to be your own promotion and marketing, right? Um, and the other thing too is that, you know, budgets are gone, right? So what is the most important thing to a, to a young producer, engineer, artist? Building a resume, okay? So get out there. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff, you know, you could say, I don't work for free. And then guess what? Neither does your resume, right? Um, a guy would, you know, somebody looking for somebody go, wow, man, you produce a lot of stuff. Yeah, none of it's hit, but I have produced a lot of stuff, right? Rather than, well, you haven't produced anything. Yeah, well, I'm waiting for the right thing to come up and tell you how great I am. You know, right, like, right. You know, this record never went anywhere, but listen, I'm, I'm really proud of it. You know, they go, wow, this sounds great. You know, um, if, if producers were measured like, like baseball players by batting average, <laughs> all of that work. <laughs> you know, other than like guys like Rick Rubin or um, or Quincy or you know guys who know how to pick things that will be hit records. Right, for sure, Max Martin, those guys, totally, totally. And yeah. you know, I I think that that's awesome and it's super encouraging to young and up and coming artists. What would you say about artist development, Francis? Do you think that that's kind of dead, or do you think that you know it's just really the artist's responsibilities now to kind of just like present yourself? Yeah. Yeah, artist. Yeah, I mean, artist development is not dead. I mean, it can't be dead. You know, every morning an artist wakes up, he's developed a little more than he was the day before it. It's sure. whether he had some of a mentor, a record company to help him along. So, artist development is always going on, right? But you know, you you almost if you think you're going to get big record label in, um, uh, attention, you're only going to get it by doing on a small scale what they would do on a large scale. Right. And economically, it almost works out that if you sold 100,000 records on your own, you would probably make more money than if you sold a million with a record company sopping up all the gravy. You may not come out more. You, you might be more popular, right, which might fill more concert halls. And so there's, you know, there's obvious advantages to it. But the, the thing to me that I see that really I go, what, what are you waiting for? Oh, the snare drum sound isn't right. Would you put the stupid song out? <laughs> yeah. For God's sake, you know? <laughs> and I know, too much perfectionism. I know, is, I know this is history, and I know this <laughs> is the technology of the, song, the time, but these cats, they did 13 albums in seven years, man. That's two albums a year of incredible music. Yeah, in part of perspective. Why. Yes, because they were cranking it out. They weren't waiting two years to do their next record. They were waiting 10 minutes to write the next song, right? Yeah. 
So and to me, I see people going, yeah, I'm working on my album. Why are you working on an album? Well, you got to do an album. Well, you got a couple songs done? Yeah, well, finish them and put them out. Well, I don't have the album done. <laughs> put your songs out, man. Yeah, let's get that EP going, it's for sure. Sing it's a singles world. It always has been, always will be. Look at the playlist. You got you have albums on your playlist? Yeah, I do. But I mean, a lot of them are singles. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all singles, so I'll be right. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that's that's what to aim for. Aim for the singles. You yeah. Know? yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So um and Francis, can you also talk about how you decided to after after you were teaching, how did you decide that you wanted to start composing? Now I want to get out of just engineering and 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 teaching and now I want to start composing, right? right? What was that transition like for you? And how did that renaissance kind of how did that rebirth happen in you? Um it's amazing what you would you can do when you're forced to do something. <laughs> Here we go again. <laughs> Um, no, I um, when I uh, when I semi retired, I said, you know, I never finished my bachelor's degree, right? And without even thinking about it, I'm working at MI, and I'm sitting there talking to one of the admissions people, and I was just talking about my daughter who had just started University of San Francisco, and it was like, you know, I always wanted to go back to college, but you know, I can't afford it. Not not with her, you know. When she's done, maybe. And she leans over and she goes, you dope, you work at a school, you go for free. Yeah. Like, okay, do you think I could do this? Right? So I signed on to a Bachelor of Music program. I already had my associates. So all of that academic English, all that stuff was done. It was just music classes. And I, had, I entered it with great trepidation because, you know, wow, my, it's been a long, long time. Am I going to be able to do this? Right? And so the, the program was called Bachelor of Music um, with a emphasis on composition for media. So it was a film composing thing, right? And the first quarter was like, wow, this is really serious. This is like strings and like, you know, this isn't just, you know, making weird noises behind a movie. No, this is like serious writing. And it was like, you know, I don't play. I'm, I'm a drummer. I play the smallest amount of keyboards, right? Um, wow. And... Second, halfway through the second quarter, I'm thinking about I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna cut this. They changed another major. They called it songwriting and production, and I went well. I got the production side. <laughs> I'll pass that. Let me get in the songwriting side, and I started in composing and songwriting because I was forced to because they were assignments. Right? I believe me. I am way too humble in the world of composing and music and having been brought up with the greatest songwriters in the world to ever say I'm a composer and a songwriter. I would, I would love to, to co-write with people and, you know, stuff like that, but I'm, I'm so new at it. But it's, it's fun. This thing you and I did together, you know. So that fun. Was fun. Yeah, yeah. And that was, again, a, 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 a result of experience, right? I, I knew that it was like, I, you know, I've listened to a lot of musicals. We, we had a class on writing for Broadway and they showed us the five or six typical patterns that Broadway things use, right? Sure. And I have to write this thing and it's like, well, how do I do it? And I went, hey, you know what? I'm just going to go out and grab a karaoke track from some crazy Broadway song and just rewrite a melody over the top and I'm going to turn into a bebopper which is, you know, bebop, that's all they did. They took the chord changes from somebody else's song and wrote a melody over it. Yeah. And I just took a song and I wrote a new melody over it, which you sang, and it was like, but a bing, but a bang, we're done. <laughs> that was so fun. I think that's so awesome that you're just constantly challenging yourself and you're, you're always treating yourself like a student of all of this, even though you've been a teacher and even though you've been at the top, the cream of the crop. It's just like, I think that that's so cool. And what a way to continue to stimulate all of that musical passion and curiosity. Mm -hmm. And like, you yeah. know, um, then we were talking about different composers and um, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you about the uh, composers in, in this little trivia questions that I'm yeah. going to do at the end of this. Oh, okay. But I, I think that your journey is so, so cool, Francis. And I wish you luck uh, finishing out the program, finishing strong. And um, how much longer do you have left? Well, I thought I would graduate at the end of this quarter because I have everything finished. Well, 
I, the only academic class, and I'm doing it right now, is intermediate algebra. Okay. Oh, uh, get out. <laughs> <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> Thank God there are algebra calculators out there. <laughs> oh gee, I hate but, getting that out of my out of my I way know. too. In that, uh, yeah. Like, and I put it off to the very end <laughs> because the reason I put it off to the very end is because I knew. Look, if I went through all that, I'm going to nail this. Math. Yeah, yeah. Good for you. <laughs> It's going to be like child's play at the end of I would, this. I would finish. Dad's composition. <laughs> I would finish at the end of next quarter because all I have next quarter is my, um, what's called the senior portfolio, you know, where you got to put something together. Kind of like a, a college thesis, if you sure. will. Right? Uh, but they're not offering it next quarter, so I have to wait an entire quarter to do so. But I'm one class away from graduating with a bachelor's degree in music with an emphasis in songwriting and production. Wow, Woo! that is so, so, so exciting. We're all rooting for you and can't wait for that to happen for you. That's amazing. You know, I mean, and you're right. It's like you, you have to keep learning, right? But the main thing for me is you really have to stay humble. And that's, and humble doesn't mean, oh, yes, I want to mean. You know, right. Quincy Jones is probably the most humble man in the world, right? And, and look where he is. And it's like he's, you know, what's, what's your idea? You know, the only time I really ever heard him say, and, and I hope I don't, this doesn't come out the wrong way, something that was not encouraging, but actually it really was, he was looking for a girl to sing a song called You Put a Move on My Heart, a Rod Temperton song that was written for Whitney Houston, but unfortunately. Uh, to Mia? Uh, yeah, to Mia, yeah. And this guy came in to, to see Quincy. He brought in a cassette of somebody and he handed him the cassette and he said, this is the next Whitney Houston. And Whitney uh, and Quincy handed it back to him and said, I don't want the next anybody. Mm. Okay. Which was really telling the guy, you, I hope you learn a lesson here. Yeah. You know? He's like, I'm not like that. And you shouldn't be like that either. Like kind of compare harsh people to each other. Like, yeah, because who knows whose career Quincy just handed back to the guy you know yeah but you know he brought he brought her in we did the first session on that song and she was very nervous and and he he said you know i know why she's nervous because you know so he said to rod temperton um i'll go uh have her come back tomorrow and i won't be here and she came back and he just burned it down nailed you know? it and, and that was, he was like, man, that's, to me, that's a producer. That's a guy who goes, I get what's going on. I see what's going on. I'm not going to force this issue. I'll come back tomorrow. I'll come back tomorrow. You know? I mean, he always had the greatest things. The, one of the best, don't drive past the money. I love that. That's like, what he's saying is no one is done. Right? Um, he, 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 he's talked to me about this is, this is a recipe. This is like cooking. I'm going to take this little basic ingredient and I'm not going to smother it. I'm going to add a little, you know, he said, you know, you got to know the difference between a pinch of salt and a dash of salt. Mm, yes. You know, yeah. And that's, you know, in the end, that's what we're all doing because you can't, I can't tell you how many times a, a, a writer has said to me, oh man, I just wrote this really cool song for hit record. I go, is it, is it in the top 10? He goes, no, I just wrote it. I go, then it's not a hit record. <laughs> <laughs> no matter how much you think it is, it's not here right until it becomes one. Right? <laughs> and nobody has a lock on that formula, right? So really, the other great Quincy quote is, "Don't nobody know nothing." And that's love it. That's a triple negative. That's awesome. That he said, you know, we're all guessing. Some of us have just a little more education and experience behind our guesses. Yeah, it's like always stay curious. And then, I mean, you can just look at Billie Eilish and Phineas, how they put something, I mean, look at them. So it's just like, you talk about not needing all this fancy gear and bells and whistles. And it's like, yeah, they pretty much showed you that, you, you know what I mean? It's, yeah, well, I like the idea that they did it in their bedroom. Oh my gosh, who would ever think of such a thing? You know? Yeah. <laughs> No, but you know, and, and and not to you know, not musicians at all who are, I mean, you know, miking and setting up their instruments. Like, I mean, it, that's amazing, you know. But I, I, I think that it makes a lot of sense ringing true to what Quincy said here about don't nobody know nothing. Like, no, if it was stay curious. 
if I was the if I was involved with the Billie Eilish record, the last thing I would ever have said was how it was recorded. You know, it would have been in an interview. Oh, and yeah, it was it was just recorded in a bedroom. <laughs> Rather than check this out, you know, it's like when somebody brings an artist, mm. especially a young artist, and they say, you know, he's he's only fifteen. And I say, yeah, he's only going to be 15 for a year. Then he's going to be 16. And then he's going to be 16 for a year. And then he's going to be 17. So if, you're, if your selling point is that he's 15, then you better hurry up. Yeah. <laughs> he's only going to be 15 for a year. <laughs> then what? And then know? what? Yep. Exactly. So that's, there's, there's the short range and there's the long range. In the short range, you're a really talented individual. In the long range, you know, you you got a career in front of you. Yeah, it's about longevity, right? And yeah. coming back and continuing. So yep. awesome. Such good stuff, Francis. So um, the last topic that I want to ask you about is home studio setup. I see that you do so many different videos. Yes, gorgeous, first of all. <laughs> I love those cool, the, the soundproofing blocks that you have there. I've seen those in a few studios. I think that they're super cool. And I, I wanted you to talk about how you how you do that and how that came about when, when you started going to different students' homes well, and helping them set up their studios. See, this is, this is probably, a, this could be another entire podcast, but yeah. let, me, let me condense it down as much as I can as far as great, I need to make some practical stuff. Okay. First of all, your room is 50% of your equation. And I don't care how good your speakers are. You bring a really great set of speakers into a bad sounding room and you're going to get bad results. Okay. So when people say to me, what do I need to do to my room. I say, I don't know, but I can guarantee that you do need to do something. Because right? even this, this room, which was, which was built, this was, was my third garage, and I, I turned it into my studio, right? Wow. I had all the limitations. There were walls. There were four walls that were already here. There was a ceiling that was already here. I had to build in this limitation, right? So <clears throat> absolutely first and foremost, most important thing in a home studio, symmetry, balance. You can't be jammed over in the corner. You can't be, you know, two feet from this wall and six feet from that wall, right? So your speakers come first. You bring your speakers and you set them in the room. You want to get what's called the magic triangle, right? And that is the distance. So my speakers are here and here. The distance from the woofer to the woofer is the distance from the woofer to me. It's an equilateral triangle. Right. So no matter how far, if I move my speakers further apart, I have to move back to, to keep that triangle equal. Right. Yeah. Once you have that, then everything else is subservient to that once your speakers are set. So if you have a piece of furniture that you bring in the room and it requires you to move the speaker, then that piece of furniture has to go. Okay, speakers are king. Right. But really, in the end, there's no room in your house that was built for music. Right, and you're going to try to make music in here. The worst thing you can do in a small room is bring in a subwoofer. That is absolutely the worst thing you can do because you're trying to 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 create gigantic waves that don't fit in the room, anyways. Right? People go, I don't get enough bottom end in my room. No, you're never you're never going to, because the room's too small. Right? So, really, in the end, what it comes down to is a reference material. Okay. I use, I use Billie Jean, right? Now, I tell people reference material can be anything you want it to be except your own stuff. You're too inside of it. You're hearing that mm. drum sound you don't like. You're hearing that reverb that you weren't happy with. No, go get some, some, one of your favorite artists, right? So I use Billie Jean. Now, I can go into any studio in the world or any situation in the world and put on Billie Jean and listen to it. And that will tell me everything I need to know about the room because I know what Billie Jean is supposed to sound like, right? So if I put the record on and it sounds like this, this is how my record has to sound because Billie Jean sounds mm. like not this. So if I walk into a room and I don't know anything about it and, I, and I'm working and, you know, I'm, you know, at an EQ, and the, the room has got no bottom end or it has no high end. You know, they've done a lot of treatment to the wall and the room's kind of dead. <clears throat> and I walk out of there, man, I may have way too much high end because there's high end. I'm not hearing it because the room is absorbing it. Or the opposite, there's getting too much of it. But when I have a reference, when I put on Billie Jean, if Billie Jean is going, 
that ain't how Billie Jean sounds. You know what I'm right, saying? Right, right. It just immediately tells me what's going on with the room. So all I do is, if I go into a room and Billie Jean doesn't sound right, I, le I put Billie Jean as part of the session. Then I can at least go to Billie Jean and listen to what I'm doing and go, okay, Billie Jean sounds like this, so does my stuff. <laughs> so at least I know, right? Because otherwise, how do you know? Yeah. This is such good stuff, guys. So like, it makes so much sense when you just yeah. think about it. Yeah. I can mix anywhere in the world on any set of monitors. No problem. However, the latest. Ooh, and greatest. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> okay. For the, literally, for the first time in history, I can put these on and know what about a third of the listening public is hearing. Because I, you know, before the pandemic, I took public transportation. I used to take the subway into work. And if there's three people on the subway, two of them are wearing these, right? So I know by putting these on, I have totally eliminated the room. The room is gone, okay? But I'm still yeah. going to go Billie Jean through these, right? And now once I got it down how Billy Jean sounds, I can mix in. So, yeah, I use these. I have small speakers, large speakers. I have... Um, you can see a small speaker on a stand back there. I have a little one above it. Right here in the center, this thing right here, that's a mono speaker. Mm. So I have four different speakers and a mono speaker. And literally, and again, I would love to say I did this on purpose, right? When I sit here and mix, this is my usual mixing position, right? But I can turn this way and mm -hmm. sit between these two speakers. I'm now in a completely different room because I've changed my, completely changed my orientation. Right. So I have just two different, completely different listening environments in the same room because I don't stack all of my speakers in front of me. Right. That's so amazing. And, you know, I think it's great that you're talking about this because it's also a roadmap for, um, I mean, for engineers. Like you want to have a roadmap to giving your artists what they need. If they come in and they say, I need this sound, I need this to sound like, you know, yeah. um, a, a such and such record. Yeah. That, that makes so much sense for you to be able to gauge it that way. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I mean, of course, I've done that my whole career because it'll be, people are always saying, we want to sound kind of like this, right? Um, I probably have the most eclectic CD collection you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can imagine. Oh, my gosh. Britney Spears to Frank Zappa in that collection because wow. I have to go and I got to, they, people want it to sound like that. So yeah. So awesome. Awesome. That is amazing. That's so great and so helpful. So I know it's going to help so many people. Yeah. So, um, and I know you're not a gear snob, but my last question for you is if you were going to have your dream studio, okay. And it was the same studio you were going to have for the rest of your life. And you were allowed to have six things. So you get to pick which mic pre you get, which compressor, which EQ, which microphone, which reverb and which set of speakers, which would they be? Um, boy, because there's two sides to that. There's the I know. I know you don't like to trivialize things. <laughs> the audiophile in me, and there's the, the practical in me, okay? So the practical in me would say, I want a pair of what I have right now. I want a pair of NS10s and a good amplifier. Mm -hmm. Because NS10s, there's a thing about them. If you were using the right way, they will give you everything you want, right? Okay, so that's one, speakers, right? Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. I already made my selection with Rode microphones. I'm sorry. I, you okay. Know, I figure I, that. <laughs> I'll put my Rode microphones up against any microphone in the world, and I will not hang my head about it. All right. Um, Mike Pre, I would probably go with a Demeter tube. I think it's called the VT oh. M1B or something like that. The Demeter tube Mike Pre. Ooh. It's okay. Awesome, right. Um, I like a tube Mike Pre when we're working digital. Right, so oh. a condenser mic, a solid state of FET condenser into a tube mic pre, because the tube will give a warmth to a condenser that a condenser doesn't have. I'm just saying okay. condenser microphones don't really have the warmth that would a dynamic. Gotcha, gotcha. Right, okay. So okay. Um, for a processor, mm -hmm. nothing. I don't want any compressors. I don't okay. you know. Okay. I'm going to, um, uh, you know, 99% of it is going to come from what's on the other side of the microphone, which is why I choose Rode microphones, because if you go and look at their, 
their um, uh, spec sheets, their frequency response charts, they're basically flat. So they're simply wow. going to be, and this may be why people don't, aren't huge fans of Rode microphones because they don't, I always say they're not going to help you out. Yeah, they're like the real deal. They're going to show you what's really going on. Yeah, and there has been times in sessions where working with acoustic guitar player and I go, what? There's, what's what's the deal with your guitar? Oh, these are kind of old strings. I go, yeah, I know, because this should be a little shinier because this microphone should... The microphone is going to give me whatever your guitar sounds like. Right? I always say, you know, if you've got a, a great engineer with great microphones and a bad set of drums, you're going to get a great recording of a bad set of drums. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, how about an equalizer, Francis? Would you do an equalizer? Yeah, I would do an equalizer. Um, software, I would probably choose. I like the um, the one from um, what is it, Fabrice? What is um, the uh, Fabrice Gabriel? He makes a thing called the uh, Aosis. Oh, okay. Aosis, yeah, it's a really nice one. It kind of reminds me of the um, my analog GML. I love my my GML's eighty two hundred. It's you know it's sits right here it's one of my favorite equalizers okay but it uh okay so that would be the, the that would be the dream okay but in practicality i have one microphone one mic pre, one equalizer one set of speakers right now with software okay what i did quite some time ago i went through and i purged my plugin folder because i got really mad when Avid changed from TDM to AAX, their, 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 their denomination for their plugins. And about 75% of my plugin folder became obsolete, right? Because they're not TDM anymore, so they won't open. Go to the manufacturers. Some of them would give you the new, some of them wouldn't, right? So you know how mad I would be if I had paid $3,000 for my GML EQ, and then next week the world decided to change connectors, and I can't connect my GML up anymore because the connector doesn't work, right? That's what they did to us, right? So for the, for the past several years, all I've been using is whatever comes with the DAW. If it's not in the DAW, I don't need it. I don't use it. <laughs> I'm not even going to think about it, right? Wow, it would be really nice if I had a, well, I don't have a, so get to work. <laughs> Good for you, Francis. <laughs> I love it. Hey. And um, I'll say this to the world too. I don't do auto tuning. I ain't, hey! a singer. I ain't a singer. If you can't sing, I'm not really interested in recording you. <laughs> As a tool, now if you go out to the studio and you do a vocal performance that's just like, wow. And there's one or two spots and you go out to try to punch them and they don't, it doesn't feel the same because we're punching in on a performance. Okay, then I'll pull out the tool and go, okay, not that you can't sing that note, you just missed it. Fair enough. You know, but when somebody comes in and they, you know, as a tool, right, that's why my, one of my favorite things with the students at the beginning of the of quarter, I'll point out, I'll point to the SSL. I'll go, you know, this is not professional. And I'll point to the Pro Tools. This is not professional. I'll point to the API, not professional. <laughs> Phonics, not professional. Need, not professional. Go through the whole school. None of this stuff is professional. I'm a professional. These are tools. Okay? And that's, that's the thing. Guys go, I got to have this or I can't. Well, then guess what? You can't. <laughs> you I know? love it. Yeah. yeah. Such good stuff, Francis. I think that's what's kept me working is because I don't, it's like, okay, I'll, here, this is what we got to do. Let's go do it. Right. Let's go do it. Let's get it yeah. done. Woo. All right. So it is game time. I'm going to ask you some fun trivia questions and then we're going to wrap up. But there's a couple of things that I just wanted to throw at you. So no more serious questions, just some fun stuff. And I'm going to time you. It's going to be only one minute. Okay. So we can't uh, think long, longly about these questions. They're just supposed to be what comes to you organically, like the first thing in your mind. So try not to think too hard, okay? They're going to start out easy, but then you might be a little mad at me for some of them, but in, in mad in a good way. It's okay. So are you ready? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so here we go. First one is Italian or Thai food? Ooh. Thai, only because I had so much Italian as a kid. <laughs> okay, fair enough. All right. How about coffee or tea? 
Oh, coffee. Okay. Rhodes or Neumann? I obviously know the answer. Um, Rhodes. <laughs> David Foster or Alexander Lloyd Webber? <sighs> <laughs> I told you you wouldn't like me very much. <laughs> There's some history in there, so I'll go with Andrew Lloyd Webber. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> the seventh. <laughs> well, the seventies or the eighties. Uh, 70s. All right, all right. Brikesti or Lexicon? Uh, lexicon. Okay. Danny Elfman or Hans Z? Uh, Danny. Hey, okay. Magneto or Wolverine? Boy, you're not getting out there. Wolverine. All right, Wolverine. All right. And how about Bocelli or Pavarotti? Oh, Pavarotti. Come okay, on. all right. And pineapple on pizza or not? Whatever you put on pizza is your pizza to eat. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. That was great. I love it. I love it. I love it. Excellent love stuff. That. <laughs> that question is so funny. Everybody's answer to it is, is so different. Some people get really upset. Some people are like, I love it. Some people are just, I hate it. I just will never oh, no. like it. Yeah. No, it's like, you know, it's your <laughs> food, you know. <laughs> My son-in-law likes ketchup on his steak, and it's like, hey, you know, it's his steak. I'm not. It's like, however you want to eat yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Oh gosh, see, and then the Italian woman in me comes out, and I'm just like, no, you need to have pasta sauce with your meatballs. Like, don't just eat like dry meatballs. Like, what? So yeah. you know, Italian women are always trying to tell you what to eat. I don't know why. I I never knew I would grow up doing the same thing to other people, but my, I, I did. My best friend's mother's mission in life <laughs> fattened me up, and you. Can yeah. Yes, yes. If you if you and your wife come over for dinner, you will see that that's pretty much the name of the game here. So, yeah. <laughs> Francis, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for your time today. I know this is going to be of so much value to so many young up and coming people who are inspired and want to get started, but maybe we're too intimidated to. And listening yeah. to you talk about it, you simplify it so much. You just make it back down to what it's supposed to be about. And that's the art and the fun and the creative part of it. And I, yeah. I think that's so special. So excited to hear more of where your journey is going and what's next in the future for you that we can, you know, look out for. I'm super excited. We're going to keep following you. I have three, four projects at the moment. I've All called right. them my, my COVID projects. And one of them is a, a band called Stuck in Colors out of Venezuela. Right. Most of these are, are MI connections. Right. Uh, and Stuck in Colors is out. There's two songs that are out in the moment. Um, there's another band I'm working with, which are MI guys. I think you, you know Galen? Yeah. Abst? Okay. His band, Illicit. I produced four songs with them. Two of them, I think, has been released already. Um, I'm, I'm mixing a, a project for a guy named Brad Wilson, who calls himself Brad Guitar Wilson. He's a blues guitar player here in California. All right. right. There was one other one. I had four of them. There's another one I'm working on. I, well, and whatever. I've got, you know. Amazing. Got a, uh, yeah. Yeah. And again, this is one of these things that's like, you know, I'm not used to it, but I'm going to have to. This is really would be my first time to get involved in what happens after we're done with the record. Normally, I would say, here, record company, do your job. Now right. there's no record company to do that job. So we'll see how far I go. See how much. Heck my yeah. All new, fun, and exciting stuff for you. Wish you tons of luck with that. And we'll all be following you. And is there anywhere that people can follow you or contact you? Um, if um, they you know, I'm, 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 I'm a Luddite. I mean, I'm on Facebook. Okay, cool. I'm on Facebook. I mean, I, had a, I, I signed for Twitter when it first started and never, ever did anything. I wish I had bought stock <laughs> instead of signing up. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I'm not great with Twitter either. I don't know what it is. It's just, I don't I, know. Once I finish school and I don't have the specter of homework every night and like, you know, intense homework for music, yeah. I'm going to have more time and be able to get some stuff done, you know, in this new world. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. We all support you and so thank you for your time today. Last piece of advice that I would throw out to your listeners, be, especially with the audio engineering, be really careful who you listen to on the web, okay? Before you listen to them, put their name into Google and see who they are. There's a lot of people out there who really don't know what they're talking about. Mm. See, guys, vet out your sources, do your research. Yeah, find out who it is. 
this guy knows what he's talking about. He's the real deal and he's here to help you. That's part of what he loves to do is educate others from his experiences and share. And that's what's so amazing about you, Francis, other than all of your, your gifts and talents. You're the ultimate chameleon, rock all your shades from composing to engineering. This is what his show is all about. I love it. So keep chameleoning. <laughs> yeah, you gotta be a chameleon. <laughs> you heard it from Francis Buckley himself. <laughs> And to you too, congratulations on your projects, all of your vocal vocal CDs and whatnot there. Thank are you your, so much. Great stuff. Thank great. you so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> yep. well, it was a pleasure having you. And everybody, please remember to like and subscribe to this video. There's going to be more awesome videos to come. And thanks for tuning in. Until next time. Great. Thank you.